thank you so much uh, is my audio clear to everyone yes very clear yes okay so the learning points during this session is how gallstones form types of gallstones symptoms of gallstones invest investigations that need to be done and what is the clinical approach to gallstones how do gallstones form just a brief slide on the anatomy of the biliary system the right and the left hepatic duct join together to form the common hepatic duct the gallbladder drains into the common hepatic duct via the cystic duct which then forms the common bile duct which merges with the pancreatic duct to form the uh, common channel and then on to the ampulla of waiter now it is important to understand that bile salts are actively secreted whereas water passively permeates through so bile salt is an energy rich process the hormone that controls bile secretion is secretin and that that controls gallbladder contraction is cholecystokinin now gallstones form either because of cholesterol lecithin or bile salts and a vary variation in the proportion of of each of these can lead to the formation of gallstones so suppose there is an increase in the cholesterol a decrease in the lecithin and a decrease in the bile salts there is super saturation of cholesterol now for the post graduates every examiner has certain keywords and if you mention these keywords they usually don't ask any further questions so the keywords here is cholesterol lecithin bile salts increased cholesterol decreased lecithin decreased bile salts and this leads to super saturation of cholesterol now there is a lot of research going on into the genetics of this and they found that suppose there is an increase in hmg coa reductase a re reduction in mdr3 or a reduction in 7 alpha hydroxylase there can be changes in the cholesterol lecithin and bile salts proportion and this leads to super saturation bile salts can be reduced because of drugs such as clofibrate and thyroxine and fasting particularly prolonged or intermittent fasting pregnancy because of hormonal changes and insulin resistance can all lead to increase cholesterol now once there is super saturation of cholesterol the next event that happens is the nucleation of cholesterol that is it comes together to form tiny nuclei or tiny fragments and this can then lead on to gallstones now what is the process that activates the super saturation of cholesterol to nucleation that is the presence of mucus glycoproteins and heat labile proteins and this in turn is activated by stasis that is gallbladder hypomotility so any event that causes gallbladder hypomotility or stasis leads to increased production of mucus glycoproteins within the gallbladder and this accelerates the process of super saturation of cholesterol to nucleation of cholesterol and there on to the formation of gallstones so the key words here is increased cholesterol decreased lecithin decreased bile salts super saturation of cholesterol nucleation of cholesterol thereby leading on to gallstones now the reason why we talked about cholesterol is because cholesterol stones are most common now having said that there are different types of stones cholesterol black pigment brown pigment mixed stones or what is called as sludge now uh, the variation in the calcium and the bilirubin concentration is what determines whether a stone is radio opaque and radio lucent so higher the concentration of calcium more radio opaque that is that it can be picked up on an x ray or a ct scan radio lucent stones can even be picked up in an ultrasound so cholesterol stones most common more cholesterol very little calcium or bilirubin component mixed stones have an equal and sorry uh, mixed stones are the most common in india brown pigment stones occurs as a result of parasitic infestation or infection and sludge is basically micro crystals of mucin that is after nucleation has happened but before it forms gallstones now i'll stop here while i while i take any questions because each each segment is is about 5 6 slides <clears throat> yes any questions please nothing i can see in chat box when i where is lecithin produced <laughs> sir um, 
so so these this is all this this all is secreted from from the liver 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 okay. and then it, it 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 flows down the uh, right and the left ducts and gets stored in the gall bladder so the gall bladder will is will is basically an extra storage tank and if i can show this 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 one slide sir so this is the cholesterol that is there this is the phospholipids that is there and this is the bile salts so your lecithin and all are all the phospholipids that are there so these are all actively secreted by the liver into the biliary canaliculi and there on to the bile ducts that is there so when you have a lower concentration of phospholipids that is the lecithin a lower concentration of bile salts and a higher concentration of cholesterol that is when the um, the bile becomes more thicker there is super saturation precipitation of cholesterol and that's what happens sir so all all these three are secreted actively by the liver by the hepatocytes into the biliary canaliculi uh nishant you can ask your question uh i think uh, sir is this imbalance between this cholesterol cholesterol less than and bile salt reversible or is it irreversible okay so it is uh, reversible now the only thing is uh, if this one is uh, yeah so the only thing is that when when there is uh, abnormal activity of these enzymes that is when that it is not reversible so which means the i'm well, well, i'm sure the, the the reason why you're asking this question is what if we only take off the gall stones to these gall stones have a tendency to come back again so the answer is no so which means that Uh, unless there is an abnormal activity of these enzymes because of a genetic cause all these variations will in the concentrations is reversible so the basis for this is in case somebody has a gall stone which has slipped into the common bile duct and there is no gall stone seen in the gall bladder there is a possibility of waiting on these patients particularly elderly patients now at at some time will in the future we should be able to identify these enzymes do the blood test will and say that this patient is likely to develop gall stones or this patient is not likely to develop gall stones does that answer your question so if it is genetic it is not reversible yes. but if it is not genetic that's the enzyme activity is all normal then it is reversible okay sir so but do we clinically test them sir genetically or only in like certain population like you said in the elderly where we think surgery might be too risky for them so the uh, genetic the genetic genetic tests are available but it is not available for routine clinical use there it is it is basically being studied in the population of gall stones with, with gall bladder cancer to try and figure out which patients with 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 gall stones can predispose to gall bladder cancer that is where the research activity is going on okay. all right sir thank you sir vinay yes sir anything can be done to prevent gall stones formation yes sir so uh, if i can just show this next slide that is there okay. so basically regular uh, eating food at regular times prevent intermittent or prolonged fasting exercise which therefore decreases insulin resistance avoiding drugs that can reduce bile salts particularly chlorpyrifos and thyroxin all of these things can prevent gall stones however the formation of gall stones is not a single factor it is multiple full of these factors that leads to gall stone formation and therefore even if you avoid one even if somebody says uh, exercises somebody avoids these drugs somebody eats on time any one of these factors could lead to the formation of gall stones right how much is the genetic component see now earlier it was told that north india gall stones are more common south india peptic ulcer is more common is that holds true or there is any substance in that yes sir so the uh, argument for that hypothesis was that uh, there is an increased concentration of certain minerals in the uh, ganges belt that is there that is the reason why they are so they are more prone to developing gall stones and gall bladder cancer that is that has not been substantiated in the sense that when you have south indians moving to that area 
no they still don't don't have an higher in incidence of gall bladder stones or if you have people who have been born in north india but settled down when well in the south there is no higher incidence of gall bladder stones in them so sorry there, there is a higher incidence of gall bladder stones even though there is no access to the water from the ganges belt so there is definitely well a genetic component to that and that is what well is well is being studied unfortunately there is not too much of research going on into only plain simple gall stones the research is going on into gall bladder cancer and gall stones that is there right okay when well, i will move on okay okay so how do gall stones present now gall stones present under three clinical scenarios one is asymptomatic one is symptomatic but uncomplicated gall stones that is only biliary colic the third is complicated gall stones either in the form of acute cholecystitis biliary pancreatitis obstructive jaundice or cholangitis and let us look at each of these three things separately now first what is biliary colic biliary colic is located in the upper abdomen or the right upper abdomen it may or may not radiate to the right shoulder and the right back it is always post prandial it usually lasts about 30 minutes to a few hours it is not a colicky pain it's a constant pain which is characterized usually as a dull ache or a sharp catch or a pulling sensation biliary colic should satisfy almost all of these criteria and only then can be attributed to gall stones it is equally important to know what is not biliary colic so if you have pain which is not in the upper abdomen for example lower abdomen suprapubic right iliac fossa left iliac fossa this is not biliary colic now some people can have pain in the left upper abdomen that's the left hypochondrium and this can be considered as atypical biliary colic only because of the bilateral innervation so which means that when you have the nerves that come from the superior mesenteric ganglia it not only supplies the right and the left side so that's the reason why sometimes parietal pain can also be experienced on the left side so what is not biliary colic is location any any uh, pain in any other part apart from the upper abdomen pre meal pain pre meal pain is not biliary colic pain which is brief and fleeting or lasts only few seconds now having said that heartburn belching flatulence bloating and diarrhea are not symptoms of gallbladder stones so coming to complicated gallbladder stones acute cholecystitis has usually constant pain which is of a much longer duration and possibly more severe it can be associated with nausea and vomiting so simple biliary colic is usually not associated with nausea or vomiting so if a patient has significant nausea or vomiting please consider that it is not simple biliary colic but possibly there is an element of acute cholecystitis going on these patients could also have tenderness in the right upper abdomen with a murphy's positive murphy's positive is basically a sharp pain that is elicited on deep palpation of the right upper abdomen this is because when the patient takes a deep breath the liver pushes the gall bladder down the gall bladder then touches the parietal wall on the right side which is being insinuated by the finger and this is what causes a sharp pain in patients who have obstructive jaundice or cholangitis they could have jaundice that is yellowish discoloration of the eyes high colored urine fever and vomiting and clinically they may have icterus along with local signs in patients who have biliary pancreatitis they have a pancreas pancreatic type pain which is an epigastric pain radiating to the central back not to the right not to the left but to the central back they could also have vomiting or or abdominal distension and on examination they could have either epigastric or diffuse abdominal tenderness now when you have a patient okay i'll i'll just stop here is there any questions that is that is there at this stage sir i can't see anything in the chat box anybody has any questions i think this is very very important what vinay has told there are three situations one is asymptomatic gall stones second thing is symptomatic third one is complicated and many times people mistake this just because there is stone in the gall bladder that they say cholecystitis i think those are all asymptomatic gall stones 
only when there are biliary colic pain then you call symptomatic and then is complicated so these three situations we have to very carefully understand to manage the problems anybody else questions okay i think we'll move on now vinay okay sir right now when a patient comes to you with gallstones in either of these these three scenarios what are the investigations to be done now this is largely from a clinical point of view the in investigation of choice to confirm the diagnosis is an ultrasound abdomen ideally in the fasting state to determine further treatment it is a liver function test because that then that then tells us whether there is a possibility of a cbd stone which is going to alter the line of management the rest of the investigations is basically to determine fitness for the surgery if surgery well is being planned now what is the role of ultrasound in gallstones it is important for the postgraduates to look at the picture that is provided along with the scan report and not only to just to read the scan report now gallstones are usually hyper echoic so when you have an ultrasound you use the the suffix echoic in a ct you you use the suffix dense and in an mri you use the suffix intense so you have hypoechoic or hyperechoic hyper means more white hypo means more dark so gallstones are hyperechoic on ultrasound irrespective of what the cholesterol or the calcium concentration is they are usually mobile which means that if you ask the patient to turn on to their right or the left these hyperechoic shadows usually move and this is what differentiates that from a gallbladder polyp now this could be present either on the dependent or on the non dependent wall so when you have a patient who is lying down if you have something on this wall that is there that is usually the non dependent wall so if you have something that is stuck here then you ideally ask the patient to move to see whether that moves and if it moves then it is more likely to be a gallbladder stone if it doesn't move then it is more likely to be a gallbladder polyp because differentiating a polyp from a gallstone will alter the management gallstones irrespective of the calcium concentration tend to have a posterior acoustic shadow and the rationale behind this is the significance of ultrasound ultrasound has those waves that are bounced back because of the gallbladder stones and therefore the waves don't go beyond on that and this is what leads to the posterior acoustic shadowing now what are the false negatives which means that a patient actually has gallstones but the ultrasound does not show any gallstones obese patients scans done post prandially after a heavy meal when the gallbladder is contracted or even a cystic duct stone it can be a false false negative false positive is the presence of gallbladder polyps or metallic clips now this is important because sometimes we use uh liga clips during the cholecystectomy a subsequent scan is done the radiologist reports it as a residual gallbladder with stones it is important to mention there that a clip has been used so that the radiologist is then able to differentiate between a clip from a uh, gallbladder stone now is it possible on an ultrasound the answer is no if they are very careful and they are able to make out a linear shadow stones are not linear if the radiologist is careful he'll be able to make out a linear as compared to a spherical or a round which is which is the case in a gallstone spherical round cuboidal those are the shapes of the gallstone liver function test now what does the liver function test tell us if a patient has a raised bilirubin it could suggest a common bile duct stone it could suggest cholecystitis with sepsis it could suggest a merisi syndrome or even a asymptomatic that is uh, incidental gilbert syndrome suppose the alkaline phosphatase is raised this basically means that there is biliary stasis in the common bile duct or in the liver and this can happen because of merisi A common bile duct stone or even pancreatitis. A raised OTPT or AST ALT. AST ALT are all parenchymal enzymes. So this can happen when somebody has acute cholecystitis, cholangitis, which leads to an uh, an, an increased pressure in the in intrahepatic biliary ductules, leading to secretion of AST ALT because of hepatocyte necrosis. A CBD stone, long-standing, Merisi syndrome, or even an acute cholecystitis. with a pericholecystic abscess which is ruptured into the liver now a ct abdomen 
When do we do a CT abdomen for a patient with gallbladder stones? Not in all patients. The indications is, suppose there is a doubt of diagnosis. So clinically, you're not sure whether this patient has acute cholecystitis, possibly pancreatic pain, possibly bowel pain, consider doing a CT abdomen, not so much to rule in gallbladder stones, but to rule out other causes. A CT abdomen is only going to pick up radio opaque stones. Radio opaque stones is less common in gallbladder stones as compared to renal stones. When a patient has clinically acute cholecystitis, that is the presence of pain, fever, vomiting, Murphy's positive, but the, gall, but the ultrasound does not show any gallstones, consider doing a CT because these patients could have a cystic duct stone, could have acalculus cholecystitis, could have pancreatitis, could have a liver abscess, could even have a duodenal ulcer with a contained collection. Gangrenous gallbladder, perforated gallbladder, liver abscesses, which means that patient has gallstones but is looking sick, possibly missing out something, consider doing a CT abdomen in these patients. Patients who are cirrhotic, patients who have a previous history of extrahepatic portal vein obstruction, these patients, even with a simple biliary colic, consider doing the CT scan essentially to assess what is the pericholecystic or the pericholidocal, that is the, the varices, sorry, varices along, around the gallbladder or the common bile duct, because this is going to determine the type of surgery that you will do, what the risk and how you will consent a patient. In any patient who has had a prior major upper abdominal surgery, there is a possible role for doing a CT scan to assess adhesions, to assess how easy or difficult the surgery is, to possibly assess what structures come in the way of access. If the ultrasound shows a focal wall thickening, consider doing a CT scan to rule out other causes, and I will come to this in a little more in detail in the subsequent slides. Now, the next line will have put a patient with obstructive jaundice and a dilated CBD. So you have a patient clinically suspected gallstones, acute cholecystitis, a raised bilirubin and a CTs and the CBD is dilated on an ultrasound. Consider doing an alternate investigation apart from just a simple ultrasound. And this is one of the reasons where you can suggest a CT abdomen. Now, what are the policies of a CT abdomen? If it's a radio lucent stone, it is not going to be picked up on a CT scan. Now, endoscopic ultrasound indications is any abnormal LFT, that is any rise in the alkaline phosphatase. Now, by definition, anything that is more than two times upper limit of normal is when an EUS can be done. However, in clinical practice, even if the alkaline phosphatase is marginally really high, we can consider an EUS. In our lab, the alkaline phosphatase upper limit is 120. It could range between 110, 130, 140, depending on the type of test that they use and the reference markers. So if you have the upper limit of normal as 120, 121, 122, 125 is not an indication for endoscopic ultrasound. However, if a patient has constant pain, back pain, even with a marginally high alkaline phosphatase, please do that. So it is important to assess what the clinical symptoms are and the blood reports before deciding on whether the patient needs endoscopic ultrasound. Uh, if the patient has biliary pancreatitis, raised amylase, lipase, some amount of back pain, do US to basically rule out a CBD stone prior to the surgery. If the ultrasound shows a dilated CBD. Now, an endoscopic ultrasound is more sensitive than an MRI and CT in detecting lower end stones. And I will come to this in my next couple of slides. An MRI abdomen is indicated when you have obstructive jaundice with undilated CBD. I'm just going to go back to the previous slide. So I've mentioned here obstructive jaundice with a dilated CBD. This could either be because of an obvious large gallbladder stone or a carcinoma pancreas, a distal CBD stricture, or even a periampillary carcinoma. And this is the reason why if you have a dilated CBD, a CT is good enough. But if you have an undilated CBD, a CT will is not going to be sensitive and therefore obstructive jaundice with an undilated CBD, please consider doing an MRI. Focal wall thickening, large gallbladder polyp, meresis syndrome, a previous subtotal or a partial cholecystectomy who comes back to you with symptomatic gallstones, residual gallstones, please consider doing an MRI to look for abnormal anatomy there in that area. 
if a patient has had a previous surgery it means that it was difficult in these patients you should consider doing another investigation apart from just a simple ultrasound now this is a slightly complicated slide us versus mri the only reason that i have put this is for you to read what is what is there at the bottom in a sense the literature says that an endoscopic ultrasound is equal to an mrcp so it doesn't mean that if you don't have facilities for an endoscopic ultrasound or you're not in favor you can still do an mrcp it is legal and valid and sorry and scientifically valid however an eos is better than mrcp for small cbd stones and the cutoff for this is less than 3 mm so if you suspect or if a patient has a less than 3 mm cbd stone an eos is more accurate than an mrcp now eos has a higher false positive rate which means that you that the patient actually does not have a cbd stone but the eos reports it as a cbd stone so these patients will be over treated and mrcp has a higher false negative rate which means that these patients have a cbd stone but the mrcp reports it as a normal cbd so these patients will be under treated and right now it is better to over treat patients than to under treat patients and therefore an eos is considered to be better when compared to an mrcp that means that a negative eos has a more um, clinical significance than a negative mrcp okay so i'll just stop here if there's any questions then i'll take it from here yes when i think there are many questions um Dr. Ramakrishna, you want to come in and ask? Hello. Yeah, welcome, Dr. Ramakrishna. Hello. Ah, just I wanted to know when exactly you are going to advise MRCP and um, uh, when CT scan, because so many indications are there in clinical practice. What we get sometimes um, a gallstone is there, and sometimes they write mildly dilated CBD. This is ultrasound report. such cases whether we should go for mrcp or ct scan yes sir so um, so, so the thing is that the decision to do a ct or an mri will is going to be decided on the clinical scenario so if a patient has bowel pain then i would prefer to do a ct scan that is so i'm so I'm talking about atypical pain first so if 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 a patient has periumbilical pain possibly colicky pain i would prefer to do a ct scan if a patient has a pancreatic type of pain then i would may prefer to do an mrcp so it is not one single thing that would determine a ct or an mr but it's largely the clinical scenario the symptoms and the investigations now between a ct and an mr most of the time we would prefer to do a ct scan if there's a doubt of diagnosis if a patient has acute cholecystitis clinically but there is no gallbladder stone seen for any other complicated cholecystitis a ct scan is better because it rules out a lot of other things as compared to an mrcp now the reason is when you ask for an mrcp the sequences which they do is not the same as an mri with an mrcp so if you do an mri with an mrcp it is possibly superior to a ct abdomen but if you just ask for an mrcp the information that it gives is inferior so the 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 only time that i would ask for an mrcp is if the patient has a raised bilirubin with an undilated cbd or a previous subtotal or a partial cholecystectomy these are my only two indications for doing an mri otherwise well i would prefer to do a ct scan for all of these patients suppose the ultrasound shows a focal wall thickening and the clinical suspicion for a carcinoma gallbladder is there and this is more towards the cystic duct i would prefer to do an mrcp an mri with an mrcp if it is more towards the fundus i would prefer to do a ct scan so my indications amongst all of this will be the first one obstructive jaundice with undilated cbd the last one previous subtotal of or partial cholecystectomy okay. right nishant Dr. Nishant, you have some questions. Okay, Vinay. Yes, sir. 
wants to know, can we pick up accessory ducts on MRCP? And also, US is observer dependent, whereas MRCP can be read by both the surgeon and the radiologist. So what's your opinion on this? Okay. But sir, I'll, I'll take the second question first. Okay. Uh, I completely agree that uh, endoscopic ultrasound is observer dependent. Uh, whatever data that I have quoted is from US papers that have been done in expert hands. So if it's a novice gastroenterologist who's doing an US, you might want to consider adding an MRCP or if the number of reports are inaccurate, you might want to stop doing an US with that particular unit that is there. Uh, the problem with an MRCP, I will agree that it is, that it is, uh, that it is a fixed thing that is there that both the surgeon and the radiologist can read. Uh, the only clarification that I have is that it is important for the surgeon to sit at the radiology console and go through the axial images and not just the MRCP reconstructed images for them to pick out the smaller lesions that is there. MR, MRI is also operator dependent to a certain extent well as compared to a CT scan because the type of sequences that need to be generated has to be told by the radiologist. So they need to decide which sequences is needed when to do T1, when to do T2, when to do a fat suppression, when to do a stir, and therefore it is it is better. But as compared to an US, an MRCP is easier to read for the surgeon. Uh, the first question was, uh, yeah, accessory, I'm sorry. Ducts, accessory ducts. Whether it can make. So up. I think that is that is a good 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 question. And MRCP is is very good to pick up accessory ducts. The only caveat here is if you have a grossly distended gallbladder with the accessory duct coming just behind it. Even if you rotate the picture, sometimes it may not be seen. So a grossly distended gallbladder with some amount of edema there, it may not be possible to pick up all accessory ducts, particularly the cholecystohepatic ducts that is there. Right. One more point to Vinay, when we suspect ah, more of neoplasm, whether it is biliary or pancreatic. Yes, sir. Uh, better to do first CT and then decide whether MRCP or MRI is required. Yes, sir. I agree completely yeah. that uh, uh, CT scan gives us a lot more information than an MRCP. I think the only time that I would do an MRI with an MRCP is if you're suspecting a carcinoma gallbladder involving the cystic duct, because then the decision to do a hepatectomy well or not would, uh, would be dependent well on what the involvement of the right hepatic duct is, which is better seen on the um, MRI. So only if it's a carcinoma gallbladder involving the cystic duct and closer, I would do an MRI. Otherwise, like you said, a CT scan will is definitely better. Right. One more thing we all should understand is when we ask for an ultrasound abdomen, what we look for when what, what information we want, what you said is from the radiologist's perspective. Yes, sir. Then what all we want to know from the ultrasound? Okay, sir. So when, when you look at the report, sometimes all of us just see the bottom line, that is the impression. Correct. But it is also important to read the description. Now, the first thing that you should try and read is to figure out is there single stone or multiple stones. This is important because in case there is an inadvertent gallbladder rupture or an injury with bile spill that is there, if you have multiple stones, it is important to clear all the stones. If you know that it's a single stone, it is easier to pick it up, even in case there is a spillage. Now, let's say that there is a single stone that is picked up on the ultrasound. You have removed the gallbladder, but you don't find a stone there. Then you need to be a little cautious that this, could, that this patient could have a retained duct stone or a slipped CBD stone. So it is important to see the number of gallstones maybe even the size of gallstones. It is important to see the wall thickness that is there. The normal wall thickness is about one to two or two to three millimeters. Anything more than that well is considered as wall thickness. The thicker the wall, anticipate that this could be acute cholecystitis, edematous gallbladder, xanthogranulomatous cholecystitis, or even a gallbladder malignancy, and approach this patient with a little more caution that is there. Look for cholecystic fluid collection, which again indicates the difficulty of the cholecystectomy. Please note the CBD because like I said, sometimes they just write mildly dilated CBD, which we really don't sort of read the 
reports finally. So if a patient has back pain, atypical pain, along with the mildly dilated CBD, consider doing some other investigation to rule out a CBD stone. That's it. I think, oh, uh, uh, yes. I think we and I, we were told a lot of good points. Along with that, I will add also that no Okay, look at whether there is any cystic duct stones. Many times that can be missed if there are cystic duct stones while doing laparoscopic cholecystectomy, we may push either to the CBD or into the gallbladder. So that's also very important. Other thing is not only look at the uh, ultras gallbladder only, look at other things also, like uh, Nishan said, CBD diameter, uh, maybe ultrasound may give good impression. Also, the liver, what is the, whether there is any cirrhotic changes or fatty liver, whether it becomes difficult, and rest of the abdominal cavity, what are the findings? Many times we see that many surgeons do laparoscopic cholecystectomy and sometimes there may be some other pathology which may be, may not be picked up. So it's very, very important to read ultrasound very carefully before starting the surgery. Any other points, uh, Vinay, or others? No, sir, I think that uh, covers most of the things. Yes, sir. All right. Other most important thing is many times patients are suffering from severe pain, but ultrasound reports are telling that uh, gallbladder is normal. Most of that's because most of the time there may be a small cystic duct and gallbladder may be distended. Many people and uh, sonologists also report it as a calculus cholecystitis. What's your opinion, Vinay, on that? Yes, sir. I'll, I'll just uh, come to that, sir, in one of, one of the next few slides, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Any other questions? Okay. Um, Nishant is asking, role of HIDA scan in gallstones or sludge? Okay. <laughs> okay, I think that is that's, uh, controversial. The only currently accepted indication is acute uh, cholecystitis or ecalculus cholecystitis. HIDA scan tells us only the gallbladder emptying time. So if a patient has a gallbladder stone, which is not obstructing the cystic duct, it will be a normal HEDA. So if you have a clinical acute cholecystitis and there is no gallstone seen and you want to confirm that this patient needs surgery, you, you do a HEDA scan. Because HEDA only tells the gallbladder emptying, not whether there is a defect inside, filling filling uh, defect inside. Yeah. In routine use, there is not much of necessity of it as can. All right, go on. Yes, sir. So I'll just come to uh, acute cholecystitis is basically uniform thickening of the gallbladder wall, more than four millimeters. Enlargement of the gallbladder from a radiologist perspective, long axis, more than eight centimeters, short axis, more than four centimeters. Fluid accumulation around the gallbladder, pericholecystic fat stranding. Gangrenous cholecystitis is where there is irregular thickening of the gallbladder wall. Irregular rim enhancement on contrast imaging, either ultrasound contrast, CT contrast or MR contrast. And the presence of gas in the lumen or within the wall of the gallbladder. Xanthogranulomatous cholecystitis is either focal or uniform wall thickening along with intramural hypoattenuating nodules. So that is what that I have shown here. Well, in this picture, this is this is a CT scan uh, of of one of our, our patients. Uh, so, so you can see these nodules that are there within the gallbladder wall. This is typical of xanthogranulomatous cholecystitis. A gallbladder malignancy usually has focal thickening, with or without lymph nodes that is there. Now, clinical approach. If a patient has typical symptoms of biliary colic and ultrasound shows gallstones, what do we do? If the patient has typical symptoms of gallbladder stones, but ultrasound shows no gallstones, this is what Sir has referred to. If a patient has atypical symptoms and ultrasound shows a gallstone, if it's an incidental or asymptomatic gallstone picked up for some other evaluation or complicated gallstones, how do we approach this? Now, in a patient with typical with biliary colic gallstones, 
LFT normal, proceed with cholecystectomy. LFT abnormal, image further, US or MRCP based on the availability. No CBD stone, proceed with cholecystectomy. CBD stone, two options, ERCP followed by cholecystectomy, lab cholecystectomy, CBD exploration, depending on the facilities that are available and the size of the common bile duct. Typical symptoms, but no gallstones. This is what Sir was referring to. If a patient has a normal LFT, consider impacted stone in the cystic duct or acalculus cholecystitis. If the patient has abnormal LFT, consider the same two along with a solitary gallstone which has slipped into the CBD. Now, if the patient is stable, please do an ultrasound in a fasting state or an endoscopic ultrasound or an MRCP. So this is what that I was saying that if you have an undilated CBD, this is when an MRCP would really help. Now, once you've done the ultrasound EUS or MRCP, if it shows a gallstone, proceed to cholecystectomy. If it shows a CBD stone, proceed appropriately. If it it shows no stones and the patient has typical symptoms. The current recommendation is to treat it for gallbladder sludge and treat the patient with UDCA. 300 to 450 milligrams twice a day for two to four weeks time. Reassess with a scanning after that. If a patient has atypical symptoms, look for other causes of dyspepsia. If found, treat appropriately. If it is not found, Treat the patient symptomatically. If symptoms persist, these patients can be operated for a cholecystectomy. For example, patient has belching, bloating. Clinically, you might suspect either a peptic ulcer, erosions, reflux disease. Do an endoscopy. Endoscopy shows something, treat it. Endoscopy is normal. Treat the patient symptomatically for dyspepsia or reflux disease. Appropriate treatment, patient still is symptomatic, do the cholecystectomy. Incidental or asymptomatic stones, the current recommendation in, in literature is no surgery. Counsel about symptoms of gallbladder stones and potential complications. However, there is a subgroup of patients in whom asymptomatic gallstones, incidental gallstones need to be operated. One, in young women who are planning to conceive, because if these patients develop problems during pregnancy, there is risk not only to the mother, but also to the fetus. When you have gallbladder stones along with gallbladder polyps, because there is a theoretical higher risk of gallbladder malignancy, in patients who have a family history of gallbladder malignancy, in children, because they are unable to communicate the type of pain, so incidental stones, asymptom asymptomatic stones in children need to be operated. Occupation, patients who are remote posting do not have access to healthcare, such as pilots, soldiers, or sailors, can be operated even if it is incidental or asymptomatic. Uh, complicated gallstones, acute cholecystitis is when you have a local sign of inflammation that is right upper quadrant pain or Murphy sign positive. And this is the diagnosis based on the Tokyo guidelines of 2018 along with systemic signs of inflammation, that is the SERS response and imaging findings, which is a thickened wall, pericholecystic fluid, long axis more than eight, short axis more than four centimeters. Definite diagnosis if you have local signs of inflammation and either imaging findings or fever elevated CRP. Suspected if you have one of these. Classification is basically into three mild, moderate and severe based on the degree of organ function that is there. Now, how do you approach a patient with acute cholecystitis? When you read the literature, there are different terms that you will come across. Urgent surgery, early surgery, delayed surgery. This is just to tell you what each, each of it is. Urgent surgery is within 24 hours. Early surgery is less than 72 hours. Although some of the newer papers have defined it as less than one week, delayed surgery is more than six weeks. In any patient with acute cholecystitis, the dictum is surgery as early as possible, anticipate difficulty and operate, consider a percutaneous cholecystostomy as a temporizing procedure in a patient who is acutely sick, has multi-organ failure with a perforated gallbladder and a patient who has all dual antiplatelets. 
there is enough evidence to say that a patient on a single antiplatelet can be operated safely but be cautious when somebody is on dual antiplatelets it is important to take a drug history because sometimes they use ecosprin gold which is a combination of two antiplatelets biliary pancreatitis if it is stratified as mild cholecystectomy at, in, at index admission if it is moderately or severe on follow up if a patient has obstructive jaundice look for cbd stone stone distal cbd stricture mirizis malignancies image further based on the clinical scenario ercp only if cholangitis or cbd stones if you are doing an ercp clear the stones and stent only if the patient has cholangitis or you are not able to clear the stones if it is mild cholangitis early cholecystectomy severe cholangitis uh, cholecystectomy on follow up okay special i'll sir i'll just stop here and i'll come come back to this sir hello yeah there are a lot of questions hello ha sir um okay sir one of the indications for asymptomatic gallstones to operate yes sir or uh, is it the size of the stone criteria more than 2 cm or anything yes sir so uh, in 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 the 1990s well, or the early 2000s the presence of diabetes and a stone more than 2 cm was considered to be a criteria for um, cholecystectomy uh, in the current guidelines they have not mentioned the size criteria although some studies still look at it as 3 cm it was earlier 2 cm now it has become 3 cm although it is not uniformly mentioned across all all guidelines the earlier concept that in any diabetic incidental stones has to be op operated no longer holds holds true sir okay so i think that answers nishant's uh, question so whatever may be the size of the stone if they are asymptomatic we can leave it as it is so so again so if you so what i'm what i'm uh, uh, telling here with just the evidence that is there sir when a large stone in my experience for it to be asymptomatic will is right unusual i think on a, on a careful history most of these patients have have symptoms what about porcelain uh, gall bladder you know okay sorry sir i think i think till i till i missed that so porcelain gall bladder is a pre malignant condition and if you have a porcelain gall bladder please operate early uh, diagnosis of porcelain gall bladder is based on calcification in the wall of the gall bladder right and uh, i think most of the other things you have covered um nishant is asking how long do we need to leave a cholecystostomy tube in situ i think when you do a percutaneous cholecystostomy yeah okay uh, that would largely depend well on what the indication for the uh, cholecystostomy is so if you have a patient with sepsis and multi organ failure you can operate as early as 2 weeks time once the sepsis has settled down but if you have a patient with a dual antiplatelet if the radiologist is confident well about doing a poke in this cholecystostomy stop the antiplatelets for 7 days and then go in if it's a perforated gall bladder uh, a large collection please wait for a minimum of 4 weeks time right most of the time we remove the tube along with the cholecystectomy isn't it yes sir when you do a cholecystectomy yeah uh nishant you have some more questions ask yourself yes sir so this is just one case scenario like assuming uh, the imaging was normal or only gallstones in the pre op period and we do a lap coli okay and unfortunately either we have a slipped stone which goes down to the cbd or there was a missed stone in the cbd which had been picked up in the imaging okay and the patient has a bile leak in the post operative period okay uh in such a condition obviously first we'll do the ercp and try to get the stone out okay and percutaneous drainage of if there is any biliary collection is that enough or do we do we still have to go in and try and close that uh, cystic duct hole okay so uh, when you have a contained collection just a percutaneous drainage along with an ercp and a sphincterotomy alone and a cbd clearance is enough you would consider a stent if you are not able to do a wide sphincterotomy or if the patient has cholangitis or if it's a large leak that's there there is no need to close the cystic duct stump because this will fibrose over a period of time 
Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah, this is another. Uh, so, yeah, during barrier. Yes, sir. So I'll suggest. Yeah, yeah. Continue, Milan. Yes, sir. So I'll th I'll just come to that. That is in uh, another another uh, slide, sir. Okay. Okay. Uh, patient on. So in CCN. Okay. Right. Yes, sir. You'll come to that. Okay. Okay. So uh, these are all special situations. Now, in somebody who is pregnant. Uncomplicated gallstones, wait and watch, and offer an early surgery in the postpartum period. When a lady is pregnant and has complicated gallstones, operate preferably in the second trimester with due risk explained. If biliary colic alone, mild symptoms, UDS, UDCA therapy during the course, and then early surgery after that. Elderly patients weigh risk versus benefit. Minimal symptoms, very high risk weight. Symptomatic low risk operate. Incidental gallstone patients undergoing another surgery, please do a cholecystectomy in patients who are undergoing a bariatric surgery. Do a cholecystectomy in patients who, are, who have carcinoid tumors or NET because these patients need sandostatin or long term octreotide therapy, which is known to increase the incidence of gallstones or cause symptoms. If you are anticipating long term PPN, please consider doing a cholecystectomy. Now, the only reason why we have not mentioned this is because at the beginning of any surgery, most, patient, most doctors don't anticipate a complication will and say that my patient will is likely to need long-term TPN and therefore will have not put it. But yes, if you feel clinically that this patient is going to need long-term TPN, consider doing a cholecystectomy if the patient is stable enough to undergo that additional procedure. No cholecystectomy if it's a separate field of surgery. And by this, I mean that if you are operating in the thorax or the groin that is outside a hernia, out, outside the abdomen, for example, the varicose vein or a diabetic foot or a thyroid, then there is no need to do a cholecystectomy where the patient is not symptomatic because that would operate an additional incision, access, or separate field of surgery. Or if the cholecystectomy increases the risk of the existing surgery. For, for example, patient has come with mesenteric ischemia, you need to remove a long segment of the bowel. This patient is likely to need long-term TPN. However, doing the cholecystectomy will is going to increase the risk of, an of, of, of doing the surgery in an un unstable patient. Don't do the cholecystectomy here. Okay. Uh, gallbladder wall thickening, please consider acute cholecystitis, xanthogranulomatous cholecystitis, adenomyomatosis, gallbladder polyps. In these patients, consider a cross-sectional imaging before the surgery. Consider an FNA if clinically appropriate and consider a frozen section. Okay. Uh, the next is the last section, sir, after this. So I'll take, take some doubts here if anything is there. Yeah, sorry, Vinay. Huh, sir. No, you should not generalize as gallbladder polyps. I think uh, size is important. Yes, sir. And um, yeah. Right. Any other questions? Somebody has. Okay, sir. So I'll, I'll just I I just mentioned 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 a few slides on this because I thought it is uh, important for the postgraduates and and it is a potential exam question. Sure. Uh, steps for a safe cholecystectomy. If you find a distended gallbladder, decompress the gallbladder using a needle, spinal needle, 18 gauge or more, that is a pink needle. Effective counter-traction by the left hand instrument. And this is something that all beginners should be cognizant about. Please, you're, you're operating with both hands when you're doing laparoscopic surgery. So use the left hand effectively. It makes life a lot easier. Dissect the posterior leaf. Sorry, it's not leak. It is posterior leaf of the peritoneum first. It is safer, uh, less likely to injure anything. Work above the ruvia sulcus, and I'll and I'll show you what that is in the next. And what is the critical view of safety? The critical view of safety, if somebody asks you, is a method of identification of cystic duct and artery during laparoscopic cholecystectomy with an idea to reduce the incidence of bile duct injuries. There are three criteria. Clear the hepatocystic triangle of fat and fibrous tissue. 
separate the lower one third of the gallbladder from the liver to expose the cystic plate and two and only two structures should be seen entering the gallbladder. All three criteria have to be met to have a proper critical view of safety. Now, how to prevent a, a biliary or a vascular injury? Effective retraction of the gallbladder with the left hand to develop a plane in the callus, creating the critical view of safety. If there is hemorrhage, compress, use a gauze piece, do not blindly use electrocautery or clipping. When to stop doing a laparoscopic cholecystectomy, when there is severe fibrosis or scarring because of inflammation, if you have an impacted stone in the confluence of the cystic, common hepatic and the common bile duct. Where do you stop? Do not dissect the callous triangle further. Do not, do not go beyond the critical view of safety. What are the bailout procedures? One, convert to an open. Two, do a subtotal or a partial cholecystectomy. Now there is a difference between a subtotal and a partial. A partial is where you remove the, the gallbladder, leaving behind a larger gallbladder stump. A subtotal by definition is where you leave the posterior wall of the gallbladder behind. In subtotal, there are two types you can have. Sorry, in partial, there are two types. One is the fenestrating, where you close the cystic duct opening from inside. Other is a reconstituting, where you just close the gallbladder stump. The advantage of the fenestrating is that it prevents residual or recurrent gallbladder stones in the remnant. Reconstituting has a higher risk of this. Alternatively, you can do a fundus first approach or you can do a intraoperative cholecystostomy. I'll just mention the take home messages and then I'll take the last, last few questions. Supersaturation of cholesterol, nucleation of cholesterol leads to formation of gallstones, lecithin, phospholipids, bile salts and cholesterol. Biliary colic is postprandial, upper abdomen, constant, 30 minutes to a few hours. Ultrasound abdomen to confirm diagnosis, LFT to determine the course of treatment. Biliary colic and gallstones, cholecystectomy, atypical symptoms and gallstones, evaluate further. Incidental gallstones, selective indications for cholecystectomy. Most important for a safe cholecystectomy, critical view of safety. Thank you, sir. I'll, I'll just take the remaining questions. Right. Excellent, uh, Vinay. So, question there. Long tip. What are the indications for surgery in a calculus cholecystitis? Dr. Adi is asking. Vinay. Okay. Uh, I think that's that's a good good question. If if a patient has clinical moderate to severe cholecystitis by definition, please operate these patients. If a patient has mild acalculus cholecystitis, I'd be a little more selective. Maybe operate if they have a second episode. If they have a previous history of enteric fever, typhoid, I would operate these patients. Uh, if they have a previous history of biliary colic, apart from this episode and stones are not seen, I would still operate these patients. So the times that I wouldn't operate is in a patient who has dengue fever, in a patient who is otherwise critically ill, is hypotensive, and that causes acalculus cholecystitis because of spasm of the cystic duct artery. Cystic duct artery well is an end artery. And therefore, suppose there's a thrombus or spasm, so these patients tend to get acalculus cholecystitis. So these patients, well, I wouldn't operate. Otherwise, I would. Nishant is asking, Sari, could you please tell us the reference for this talk <laughs> for further reading? Oh, uh, many books. I have, well, I've actually not, not read a book, but it is just from whatever that I've learned and practiced and heard elsewhere. So I, uh, Nishant, well, I, and they don't have a reference. You can take the talk itself. It's okay. Uh, we have recorded it. We'll share it. Huh. Correct. Now you have structured your talk very well, Vinay. See, yes, thank you, sir. indications to put the drains in uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy? Yes, sir. Um, okay, sir. I'll, sir, I'll be a little more pragmatic, sir. 
as as a junior surgeon i would err well on the side of putting a drain uh, as as i become a little more senior and more confident i would err err on the side of not putting a drain however suppose there is uh, a pyo seal a gangrenous call bladder with bile spill that is there peri polycystic fluid collections which i am not confident about giving a good peritoneal lavage so i would put in drains otherwise my indications for putting in a drain well has actually come down from when i started out doing a polycystectomy to now sir uh, sir i'd like you to answer that question because you have a lot more experience than me so may, maybe you would you would be in a better position to answer that question sir i think uh, what you are telling is gone everybody has most important is when you think when you have a complicated gall bladder empyema or uh, you have stone spillage you already told uh, more of sepsis portion i would go for uh, drain because we have to drain those collections or in post lab coli collections are more higher chances in that uh, otherwise uh, indications of drain has come down also when we have a good interventional radiologist in the hospital or so we may be a little uh, less put drains and we you think that if there is a problem we can manage post operatively um yes um and if your cystic duct closure is not very good and also we had a partial or subtotal cholecystectomy chances of leakage from there is more then also we'll put drains okay sir thank you sir um nishant is asking how do we identify the junction of cystic duct and cbd because when we use excessive traction we might be pulling on the cbd also and inadvertently clip a circumference of the cbd very good i think that is that's a very practical question that is there so two points that i'd like to make one uh, going by the current evidence it is not necessary to dissect the cystic duct till its insertion into the common bile duct you can just milk the cystic duct and if you're sure that there is no cystic duct stone uh, you can clip it even leaving behind a small stump the reason for this is uh, when you look at the anatomy the valves of heister is there at the junction of the gall bladder and the cystic duct there is nothing between the cystic duct junction well and the common bile duct and therefore that drains very effectively if you were to leave a remnant gall bladder there could be a spasm well of the valves of heister and this leads to detained stones that is there the second point just before clipping it is a good idea to release the traction well on the left hand to ensure that the cbd is not tented and then clip it above the ruvia sulcus i think uh, when i has nicely told but uh, nishant i will tell you we have stopped looking at the cbd and cystic duct junction that is dangerous what we have to dissect is at the neck of the gall bladder and as when i said look at the cystic duct don't go to the cystic duct cbd junction at all that is little risky milk out the cystic duct and go towards the neck of the gall bladder that is the safest what do we do for spilled stones and and unfound stones okay uh so i, I think this this is again a good practical question that is there if it is a large stone so if the pre operative ultrasound shows a large stone and although there is no criteria for what a large stone is anything more more than a centimeter well i would make a definite attempt to try and find it because these patients tend to have abscesses that are that are there but if there are tiny stones that is there please do a good peritoneal lavage most of it comes down and in the absence of an infected gall bladder a lot of these things don't don't lead to complications but if you've had an infected gall bladder uh, a large enough stone multiple stones that are there anticipate that these patients could come back with an perihepatic abscess which may require further intervention very well said i also add that please record these things in your operation notes very important when we some problem occurs later to go back and see whether there were stones spillage 
and there was any possibility stone left out or anything uh, better to say that there was stone spillage and good wash removed and attempted to remove all the stones i think uh, we'll stop here mm, this topic is so huge we can discuss the whole night also thank you very much i think we had good interaction very good talk by vinay but thank you very much good night thank you vinay thank you sir thank you sir thank you sir good night good night thank you everybody thank you sir good night good night good night